Hey everybody, it's Irene with Brainstorm Makers. And today is a nice hot day again. My watch is reading 100 degrees, so that's about 105 in the yard. And it seemed like a perfect day to discuss pest control. Pests can come in all shapes and sizes, but today I'm going to focus on insects. We also have rodents and rabbits and deer and all kinds of other charming animals that are native to our area or have been imported by somebody else, and they are also a problem, but not today. So I'm going to divide this into two pieces. I'm going to divide it into what people would call natural and then artificial. And by artificial, I mean using chemicals of some sort, whether they're natural chemicals or other chemicals. I'll deal with that in a second edition of this. Today, what I want to talk about is what people consider to be natural control. Now, I have to tell you that legally speaking, natural means absolutely zero. It does not indicate organic. It does not indicate uh, that there are certain chemicals missing or anything else. But in my case, what I mean by natural is things that are easy for people to do that seem as non-intrusive as possible. So for instance, there are people who believe heavily in companion planting and feel that companion planting improves not only the health of the individual plants that are involved in the relationship, but also tend to repel bugs. I'm not going to tell you yes or no on this. I'll be honest. I have tried it. I have never seen any marked difference. It often looks really nice because you'll have different textures of leaves and different colors of leaves and heights and plants and stuff like that. And I like that as, as an aesthetic value. But that is an option you can try. You could try to use, for instance, marigolds have traditionally been believed to repel lots of things, everything from rodents to dogs to cats to, you know, all kinds of things. I love marigolds. So I do have marigolds sort of spotted around the yard. I honestly can't tell you if it improves anything. It does improve perhaps pollinators because some of the pollinators are attracted to it. But I just plain love them, so it's not a big burden if I decide I'm going to do this. But I can't guarantee you it's going to make a difference for you. So what else can you do? Well, you could just plain pay attention, okay? And what I mean by that is every morning when I go out early, because it's cooler then, I harvest my squash and any other cucurbits, anything in the cucumber melon family, and I check those plants for bugs. So what I'm going to do if I find a bug is not grab the sprayer and go get some sort of chemical mishmash. No, I'm going to squash it. Now, if you can't deal with squashing things with your hands, wear a pair of gloves. If you have huge quantities of them, you can knock them into a container with either soapy water or kerosene or something like that. And what I mean by that is, okay, as a kid, we didn't have a lot of sprays and stuff like that available. And my mom wasn't super clever about things like that. So she wouldn't have known about it and she would have probably been afraid of it. And that's not a bad thing because there are certain people who just shouldn't play with chemicals and I would put her in that category. But it was my job when we would have a Japanese beetle infestation to go out to the rose bushes with a can of kerosene. And it was just a soup can or something like that that had, you know, two inches of kerosene in the bottom of it and a stick. And every time I found a Japanese beetle on a leaf or a, or a flower, tap it, make it fall into the kerosene, dead. Now, if you have critters, if you have uh, chickens, ducks, things like that, they would like to eat these, get yourself 
can of water. Maybe you could put uh, a little bit of Dawn Dish Soap. Now, okay, here. I'll stop on this one. Dawn Dish Soap. Why is it magic? It's not. It's used as what they call a surfactant. That means that the, it, it changes the tension on the top of water. So when you drop a little bit of that in there, it means that a, a bug can't usually stand on the top of that water anymore. It'll sink through it. Pretty much any dishwashing soap will do that. I think the reason Dawn became so popular is because it was used a thousand bazillion times by rescue organizations because they found out that they could wash things like ducks and seabirds and stuff like that that had been coated in oil from oil spills. But you don't have to use Dawn if you don't ha I don't have Dawn. I have had it before, but I just don't happen to own any right now. But I have another pretty non-toxic version of dishwashing soap. So when I need to have some sort of dishwashing soap in there, I just put a drop or two of that in there and it works fine. All you're trying to do is make the bug not be able to float on top of the water. So when I was in college, I, got, I was visiting my then boyfriend and his family and his dad was an organic gardener but he wasn't particularly knowledgeable. He just had this goal to be organic and he hadn't done really much research and he had a plague of potato beetles before and in his garden. I mean, it was just, the, the plants were covered with them. And I said to my then boyfriend, do you got any kerosene around here? And what I did was I got an old can and I put some kerosene in it. And every time I walked past the garden, I'd do the same thing I did as a kid with those Japanese beetles. At first, it would take me, you know, 15 minutes to get through a single plant. But after the second or third day, I had simply physically removed all of those beetles. And he said, you know, you saved my crop. And I'm like, cool, next time I'm here feed me potatoes. But the point was, you don't have to use anything toxic. You can do it that way. I have done it that way effectively here with uh, squash bugs, except I'm squashing them. I'm not dumping them into water. I don't have chickens. I don't have ducks. So that means I have to be able to get rid of the critters myself. And for me, that involves squashing them. When I go through my cucumbers in the morning, I watch for squash bugs. I watch for egg masses. And this is where your personal education becomes important. When you see a bug, figure out what it is. You can get some guides to common bugs in gardens. Sometimes mm, the extension offices used to have them. I don't know that they do anymore. They've been kind of defunded over the last 20 years. So they may not have anything like that. There are books available. I bought one from Johnny's Select Seeds on diseases and pests a couple of years ago. That's mostly actually diseases. I have another one from Rodale Press that has all kinds of good color pictures. If you go online, there's a, a, probably a hundred, not just a dozen, <laughs> probably a thousand actually, because they probably come in every language. Uh, so websites out there, if you look for garden pests, it'll bring these things up and it'll have pictures and you can look through the stuff and you know it doesn't take long to figure out most things. Now I'll, I'll admit I have a weevil this year that I have not been able to identify, but I knew he was a weevil. It took me, you know, just a couple of minutes to realize he was a weevil, and I knew that there was no such thing as a good weevil. So it was a matter of me determining whether he was something that looked like a weevil, it could be a good bug, or he was a weevil. He's a weevil. So every time I see one, I squash him. I'm hoping to still identify him, because I like to know. It's called know your enemy. <laughs> but if I can't, oh well, I've never seen him until this year. Okay, climate change? I don't know. Maybe something just blew into the area. That happens too. So... You'll have to figure out what the bugs are. There's uh, Facebook groups on insect identification. They usually have very strict rules about how you have to post the stuff. You have to post the picture, you have to post the location, the time, that sort of stuff, and no extraneous material. But they will help you identify your bugs. There's also gardening groups where you could post, hey, I found this in my, in my tomatoes, what is it? Okay. I recommend that everyone who is a gardener learn the super basics. What does a tomato hornworm look like? What does a flea beetle look like? What does a squash bug look like? 
what does a stink bug look like? Squash and stink bugs look a lot alike. They're say in the same basic families, and they're just as obnoxious. And they some, neither of them smell particularly good when you squash them. So I just squash them. These are your main things for most people. Spider mites. If you find this sort of a spidery filament, sort of like a miniature spider webs on stuff, you got spider mites. So there's a few basic bugs that everybody needs to make themselves familiar with. And then you have to figure out how you control them. Cucumber beetles, potato beetles, squash bugs, tomato hornworms, the larva for many of those can all be controlled by hand. It gets harder and harder the worse your infestation is. If you have one plant, no biggie, spend 20 minutes, go over the whole plant, pull all the crud off there, squish it, put it, throw it away, whatever you're going to do with it, feed it to your critters if you have them, and Okay, a lot of times on, in the past, now not the last couple of years, but in previous years, I would have a squash plant and I noticed that if my squash bugs had gotten out of control, they would tend to congregate on the bottom of the leaves in the afternoon when it got hot. And I could take off a single leaf and destroy hundreds if not thousands of these things all in one fell swoop. I was watching a program one time on organic gardening, truck farms, small ones in California, and this guy was going down the row of plants and shaking them, and he had a vacuum, and he was literally vacuuming up the bugs that came off there. So I have done that with squash bugs, and I've also done that with white fly. You're simply physically removing the bug. You're not putting any chemicals on the plant. You're physically just removing the bug. And he's now inside your, your uh, uh, vacuum. I've done that in the greenhouse a couple of times when we had uh, thrips and also for white flies in there. If I, didn't, I, if I didn't feel like it was a major thing and I didn't feel like I wanted to spray, I could do that. You can use traps, sticky traps. Um, I don't use sticky traps in the garden. The reason being is they, the ones that have, that are just like, let's see here. If this, if this was your sticky trap, it comes flat and it's, it's, it's usually folded with the sticky stuff inside. You open it up. Now the sticky stuff is on the outside. You, you now have it all over your fingers unless you're very careful. And now you fold it like that. So you have two sides to the paper and it's usually yellow. Uh, except for thrips, they use a blue. I mean, there's a couple of different things. But things like yellow can actually attract and kill bees and uh, hummingbirds have been known to get stuck to them. If I was going to use a sticky trap in the garden, I would use the ones that look like an A-frame. So the, the thing would look like this and it would have a bottom to it and it would have stickiness on the inside with usually either a pheromone, which is the hormones that attract other bugs uh, or animals or people, <laughs> uh, or some sweet smell or something to it, you know, so that the bugs are attracted, they go inside. You're less likely to get good bugs that way. I do use the sticky traps in the greenhouse, but I prefer not to risk the good guys out in the garden. So I don't want to go out there and find I've got a praying mantis stuck to my sticky trap. That would be like tragic. Speaking of praying mantises, that is another thing you can do to control your bugs in the garden. Now they only have so much capacity. You need to know what are your good bugs, praying mantises, uh, ladybugs. You need to know what your ladybug larva looks like, things like that because you don't accidentally want to squash those guys instead of the bad guys. You can also use those in a greenhouse situation, and I have actually purchased ladybugs before. I purchased wasps, and I've purchased, hmm, I forget, some other kind of little flying bug. Uh, the ladybugs worked pretty well, but sometimes it's hard to keep them to where they are. So if you release them in your garden, they'll be all over the place for 24 hours, and then you may or may not see them again, and they may just leave. 
there's no way to keep them there. I mean, you can follow all the instructions that will help, but I have done it before in the greenhouse and that worked pretty well. I mean, it was a mixed bag. Sometimes it worked really well and they stayed around for weeks. Other times it seemed like they were gone in two days. We don't have a completely enclosed greenhouse. If you had a completely screened greenhouse where there were no openings to the outside, then they would have to stay in there. But if you don't, sometimes they leave and it may not be anything you've done wrong. Uh, I used the special feed that they suggested to encourage them to stay, everything. And one time it worked great, another time it didn't. So, you know, it doesn't mean I'm going to stop. I have used them before. I will use them again if I feel like I need to. And people will put, you could get um, praying mantis egg cases and put those in your garden. Just follow the instructions. Uh, if you want to find something in your area, and I recommend finding something as close to wherever you live as possible. Uh, in my state, there's a company named Arbico. I live in Arizona that has done a really great job for us. We have gotten uh, predatory nematodes from them. We've gotten a bunch of different things from them and been very satisfied with all of their customer service. Even physical things like rope covers and stuff have been great from them. Try and find some place as close to where you are as possible. Sometimes the big box stores will have things like ladybugs. To be honest, most of them don't take very good care of it. We do happen to have a good hardware store up in uh, Flagstaff that actually stores theirs in a fridge until the day that they bring them out for sale. So they'll have a back stock, but it'll be in the fridge. So that puts them into a dormant stage and you'll have a much higher survival rate with your ladybugs and things like that. So it, the best thing to do is try and look local. Uh, the big box stores that I've seen here, they're usually three quarters dead by the time you buy them. And it might be better than nothing, but I prefer to, you know, bring live bugs in, in this case. What else could we do to control insects? <sighs> Right now, I am squashing by hand several kinds of bugs. Not my favorite thing. I used to be a bit squeamish about the really large ones, like sometimes when you get a tomato hornworm that's as big around as your finger and three or four inches long, oh, it's, those I still have a hard time touching because it's kind of like a, I don't know, it's like a, it's like a live thing that has a brain or something. And they don't really. I mean, they're, they're a pretty minimal <laughs> critter, but in terms of... Uh, the uh, brain capacity, but they're pretty gross and squishy. I frequently will actually use a pair of tongs for those and uh, dump them on the ground and then squish them that way. When my son was little, I used to actually throw them out on the, the back patio and he would run them over with his big wheel. So, you know, I'm sure I warped his psyche, but hey, you know, <laughs> he seems okay. He's a grown man now who's fully employed. So, you know, I'm assuming I didn't warp him too much. He knew they were the bad guys, so it was okay to kill the bad guys. One thing that helps with finding critters, uh, UV flashlights. UV flashlights are fairly commonly available in Arizona because they are used for hunting scorpions at night. Uh, follow the instructions. You're not supposed to shine it in your eyeballs and things like that. But they will make scorpions glow in the dark. They will also make the stripe on the side of a tomato hornworm glow like crazy in the dark. So if you're having trouble spotting tomato hornworms, when I am looking for tomato hornworms on my plants, I look early and I look late. I also glance every time I walk by the plants, of course, because you just might catch the movement or something like that. And what usually will catch my eye is the movement. They will be moving something. Their mouth will be moving. They'll be wiggling around a little bit and that's it. They're toast. If you have a hard time spotting things like that. Get yourself a UV flashlight, go out at night, and they will glow in the dark. Literally, that stripe on the side of them is like a little neon light. So I hope this helps you figure out some ways to control. If you have questions about specific types of bugs, probably the most minimal thing, you can always use soapy water, and you can literally rinse things off. If you see ants all over your plant, the chance is very good that you have aphids because ants actually will farm aphids and they, because aphids produce what they call honeydew which is a sweet liquid and that's what the ants want so in a case like that you can literally squirt it with some soapy water 
that'll and wash off the ants uh, the uh, aphids and that'll temporarily control the ants too if you have questions about specific bugs don't hesitate to ask i'll do my best that certainly does not cover every bug out there and there are a lot of bugs that you cannot control by hands i mean if i see one i squash it but for instance if i get a flea beetle infestation it's time to go to the big guns and I'll be doing another video on that because I'm seeing a huge amount of confusion about that. So that means we need to talk about it. So until next time, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And we'll talk to you later. Bye.